What's going on, everybody? I hope you all had a great weekend, and thank you so much for tuning in to The Word on Woodward, presented by Raymond. Empower your purpose with Raymond. You know you can catch us every Tuesday and Thursday right here starting at noon. You guys, we've got a big show today, perhaps the biggest thing, The Winged Wheel, a documentary that takes you behind the scenes of the Red Wings, is going to be making its premiere today, and that documentary is presented by Bud Light Seltzer, so that will happen later in the show. Very exciting. And, of course, we've got some great guests, including Ken. Ken Kale and Billy Bean, former Red Wings goalie Kevin Hodson, Matt Shepard, and much more. Guys, before we get started, I want to remind you to turn on your live notifications so you don't miss a single second of the word on Woodward. Now, let's get into this and to start the show, you know we've got to bring in my co-host, Art Regner. Art, how you doing today? I am doing well, Daniela. I, uh, I, I feel great and uh, I'm looking forward to the show. I'm looking forward to a big week. Uh, you know, I, uh, mm -hmm. I called my, uh, my barber yesterday, uh, young, a young lady named Erica <laughs> who's been cutting my hair for 20 years. And I found out that I can see her on July 1st. So, uh, you know, the dry shampoo is, is looking good today. I, I, I keep experimenting. My, my hair is now reached a point of being seedy. I'm just looking seedy and that's not a good look for anybody. All right. I think you should just let it go. Keep it growing. All summer. I, you know, I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I could, but it's, it's extremely <laughs> unruly. And so, so we'll see, you know, but, uh, uh, yeah, Kenny Cal is uh, texting me right now telling me I've got that seventies look. Uh, if I had the real seventies look, my hair would be down to be down to here. But, uh, uh, you know, but anyway, I, I mean, Hey, it is what it is. And so, you know, Hey, at least I have it. At least I have hair. I'm not directing that to anybody anybody out there, Ken Cal, at all. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, our, unfortunately, your hair didn't make the big three today. So let's get in to the big three presented oh. by our friends at Chevy. The first topic is the Tigers draft review here. The Tigers have received really great draft grades. They've received A's. And received A's and A pluses as far as I've been able to see. And we're going to bring on Dan Dickerson. And we've also got um, Matt Shepard joining us later in the show for the headliner to talk about these picks individually. But Art, we kind of knew Spencer Torkelson was going to go number one. But the rest of the draft, the Tigers did really well. What was your overall reaction? Well, I, I was I was ecstatic. And, I, and I'll tell you what, I got to give big props to Double D, Dan Dickerson, who said, watch out for that Ohio State catcher with the 38th pick. I mean, he had practically called that, uh, uh, you know, Dylan uh, Dingler was uh, was a guy the Tigers were really high on. And obviously, but the two players, besides, of course, the Torque man uh, that, that I'm really into, is Daniel Cabrera with that, you know, competition balance pick, whatever, whatever in the heck that is. But, I mean, I think Cabrera is a steal. And then Colt Keith, the young guy from uh, uh, Biloxi, Mississippi, the Gatorade Player of the Year for Mississippi, uh, a, a guy I guess the Tigers are going to sign. When I first was reading reports, it was like, I have a number in mind, uh, and if I don't get it, I'm going to go to Arizona State. Well, uh, you know, I guess the Tigers are going to probably end up matching that number. So this is a good draft, top to bottom. What I really like about it is, is that they're shoring up positional players. I know last year they drafted positional players to go along with their young arms. And this is the most exciting thing, Daniela, about a rebuild is we're watching the pieces coming together. Steve Iserman, there we go, number one. Steve Iserman alluded to it uh, uh, when he gave a press conference that this is an exciting time because he wants you know fans to just embrace I was there when Spencer Torkelson got drafted or whomever the Red Wings, you know, are going to draft in the first round. And you can go back to certain moments and you can see the building blocks of the foundation being laid. And I, I think that's really exciting. I think this draft, this 2020 draft, as weird a year as it has been, that is going to be known for a lot of bad things. If there is hopefully some light at the ray of the tunnel as, you know, for sports and a little bit of an entertainment and as a diversion, this 2020 Tiger draft could possibly be that little crown jewel in what has been really kind of a dark year. 
Definitely, it was really great. And a guy that you didn't mention, our Gage Workman, who was uh, in the fourth round, expected to go a bit earlier than the fourth round. So a bit of a steal there for the Tigers, too. But guys, like I said, Dan Dickerson and Matt Shepard are going to join us later in the show, and we will dive deeper into the Tigers 2020 draft class. So for now, let's move on to our second topic of the big three. And that one today is the AHL assembled a return to play task force. Now, this is big because we've talked about the AHL are they going to return? Are they not? What's going to happen with them? And now they've got a task force that will try to make up the best way for the AHL to return. And on that task force, we've got some, some, well, excuse me, some familiar faces in Steve Eiserman and Ken Holland, both being a part of this task force. And there's the second Steve Eiserman mention of the show art, but it's great to have guys like these that, you know, can, can do this. They're, they're really, they're smart and they know hockey and they know exactly how they're going to make this league come back, hopefully as strong as it was before. Well, right. It, it's a pretty impressive list. You know, Ken Holland, who's really one of the innovators. I mean, you know, five, uh, five minute overtime, three on three, uh, you know, uh, going mm -hmm. to first the five minute overtime, then going to three on three and, and you know shootouts. Kenny was instrumental in all of that, and of course Steve is mm -hmm. is, is is an innovator in his own right. And yes, Lee fans, Kyle Dubas made it too. Uh, you know David Poyle from Nashville. I mean, there's some really big hockey names, and then plus several general managers from the AHL. What this really tells me is, and, and this is more of a a task force which is going to give recommendations about how the AHL could open something that, you know, they're, they're mm -hmm. looking for a system that's going to be popular with fans and people are going to be able to embrace. It's really going to be difficult. But again, as I said earlier, what it tells me is, is that, you know, Steve Eiserman wants the AHL to play. I mean, if you're a Red Wing fan, you want to see the Griffins take the ice next year simply because they have so many high end players. And if that can happen, uh, you know, so much better for the organization, or they're going to have to figure out a way. And, you know, I've said this before, they're going to have to expand the roster. So a lot of their high end guys can be on the Red Wings next year uh, simply because they have nowhere else to go. So I, I think this is a really good move. I think what, you know, I'm not surprised Ken Holland was on it, but when I saw Steve was on it, I, I, I really took notice because it's vitally important for a rebuilding team. And for all teams in general, but for a rebuilding team to have their AHL affiliate play so they can put all their guys together, they can form a bond, they can all be, uh, you know, we're going to have Kevin Hodson on later in the show today about how the Adirondack Red Wings, you know, with Ozzy and, uh, you know, Drapes was down there, Marty LaPointe, you know, all those guys kind of formed a bond. They all kind of came up together. And, and, and I think that's mm -hmm. extremely important. I know that's what the Tigers are trying to do on their end, and they're going to be very successful at that, I feel. And then if you look at the Red Wings, I think they're trying to do the same thing. Well, you need a place to play. And for the you know, and it's the AHL. It's the Grand Rapids Griffins. And so uh, I, I really think that they're trying to get serious. They're trying to figure out a way. It's vitally important. And, you know, I think that Steve Eiserman, Kenny Howe, David Poyle, perhaps Kyle Dubas, uh, you know, and, and all the other, there are four or five general managers from the AHL clubs, uh, not from Grand Rapids, by the way, which would be Ryan Martin. Uh, so in a way, he's if Steve's on it, Ryan's kind of on it too, I guess. But uh, uh, but with that said, uh, I, I'm looking forward to this. I'm, I want to see what they come up with. I think it'll be like several recommendations, and whichever one seems to gain the most steam will probably be the one, hopefully, that they'll eventually go with. Definitely. It's a great start for the AHL and hopefully we can see them return when the NHL does as well. All right, let's move on to our third and final topic of the big three for today. This one is really cool because Learn, Play, Score and the Red Wings have kind of teamed up for their street hockey tour that they do every summer. But because of COVID-19, they obviously have had to make some adjustments and it's going to be virtual this year. So street hockey in the D at home. This is also powered by Chevrolet. And there's different times for you to register at parks throughout Detroit, but you'll be taught some hockey skills virtually. So a great way for kids to still learn the game of hockey, but you know we have to abide by the safety rules and the CDC regulations from COVID-19. And I think this is just awesome of the Red Wings and the Learn, Play, Score initiative to get hockey out in the Detroit communities. 
Well, right. This this is a million dollar initiative by the Red Wings, and I think it's something that the NHL wants to adopt. Learn, learn, play, score. Uh, it, they're pumping m- money into the city of Detroit for youth to learn about hockey and life skills too. This is a complete package. It's a complete program. It's just not about hockey. It's about molding young minds in life and giving them chances and opportunities. I love this program. I think it's excellent, and I'm glad to see that you know that they're stepping up and they're trying to uh, you know virtual stuff. You know, if you were to talk to me about virtual stuff, like even like what three months ago, I would have been clueless. You know, virtual what? You know, I'm thinking. Right. You know, I think virtual. I think those those things that you put on, uh, you know, those goggles or that little helmet. And, you know, you have like meteors coming at you or something. You're like, whoa, you know, uh, uh, I, I have no idea. But I really think that this is uh, uh, this is a great program. I'm really eager to to talk to people about this within the Red Wing organization, see how this is all going to come down. Because, you know, Daniela, in case you haven't known, I've covered sports in Detroit for a long time. And I always have to say this about the Red Wings and their organization. They have always given money. To, the, to, to youth hockey and programs all over the state, really, but in the city of Detroit specifically, whether it was fixing up uh, uh, the um, Clark Park or uh, City Ice Arena, they've always had these initiatives. And Learn, Play, to Score, I think, is the, the genesis of all of that. This is a great program. This is something I know the NHL is really, really on board with. And, you know, uh, I, I'm really looking forward to it because, as we know, Uh, Hockey is a great game. Hockey should be for everyone. And the Red Wings are doing their darndest to make sure that hockey is for everyone. And for anybody that was interested in some more registration info, the registration will begin for the city of Detroit youth age 6 to 14 on Wednesday, June 17th at two Detroit parks. And the registration will be June 17th through the 19th, June 22nd and June 23rd and 24th from 8 to 11 a.m. And the two parks are Adam Bootsel Recreation Complex in Detroit and then Farewell, or I'm sorry, Farwell Recreation Center also in Detroit. So like you said, Art, very exciting. And the Red Wings are always doing great things for the youth community in the city of Detroit. So we're really looking forward to that one. And that wraps up our big three for today, everybody. A big thank you to our friends at Chevy for presenting the big three. Chevy Clean Dealers are committed to using enhanced vehicle cleaning measures with CDC approved cleansers. So when you're ready, you can find new roads with confidence. And as promised, you guys, Ken Kale is going to join us for today's mailbag delivered to you by Little Caesars. Ken, it's always great to have you. How was your weekend? It's been a few days since we've seen you. Yeah, it's been a while, but it's always good to be on the Word on Woodward show. It's good to see Art. And uh, boy, Art, I like that 70s look. I got to tell you that. Good to see you too, Daniela. <laughs> well, you Thank know, you. Ken, uh, I, 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 I want to I just want to see you pull out some pictures from the 70 and see your, you know, your golden <laughs> locks. I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I think that was a big you point, uh, 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 revealing uh, pictures. Go ahead, Kenny. <laughs> you know what? I was uh, the other day I had a um, uh, my Wayne State University math eye building card. You had to have this card to get in to use the facilities, you know, the gym and everything, the pool. And uh I should dig it up, but the, the thing is, is there's a picture of it, and I can't believe it. I, I actually did have some hair. I had bangs, and I had hair down about, you know, past my ear, so it was kind of oh, strange wow. to see that, but that's what happens over the years. You know, you lose it. Now I need some Scott Turf Plus 2 and a little water to go on this coconut. <laughs> <laughs> really? Art said golden black. Were they actually golden, Ken? Was it a blonde, or were they, did you have brown long hair? No, they were, I don't know, they were like a dirty blonde, I guess. But uh, it was longer back then, you know, (laughs) in the 70s, just kept your hair a little bit longer, but... Yeah, you know, Danielle, I've heard that the uh, 1970s Ken Cal was dirty in so many ways. I don't know exactly what that means, but I, and I, yeah. I think they actually named a beer after it, you know, Dirty Blonde or something. I don't know. <laughs> All right, guys, it's here fire. is it's- the first question of the mailbag. And this one is for Ken. It's the anniversary of the 98 Stanley Cup today, you guys. That's exciting. Ken, what was your favorite memory from that team? Well, the team itself had something to prove, obviously, because of the car accident that happened in 1970 or um, 1997. 
So really the season was a dedication of Vladimir Konstantinov. And <clears throat> excuse me, obviously it was that um, celebration on the ice with Vladimir Konstantinov that I'll always remember when uh, they gave him the cup and he was in his wheelchair. And that's something that uh, I think all hockey fans will remember about that 98 Stanley Cup team. But the other thing I remember is um, I remember taking the subway to game four to get to the arena and uh, there were all Red Wing fans in their Red Wing sweaters on that subway. I couldn't believe it. It was like I was going to a game at Joe Lewis Arena. And they were all chanting, uh, let's go Red Wings and sweep and everything else. And the other thing I remember, too, is uh, at the start of the game, there was a whole section of Capitol fans. And then our accounting department with the Wings, they had like eight guys in a row all with the sweaters on. And they stood out like a sore thumb. So that was nice to see the accounting members uh, at that game four, too. They made the trip. And, uh, you know, also just the celebration afterwards to win it on the road. It was a little bit different than winning at home. So it really was a, a really emotional Stanley Cup final and uh, for the Red Wings and, of course, Vladimir Konstantinov. But uh, something I'll always remember. All right, I'm going to let you give your favorite memory on this one, too, but you have to keep it to one memory. That's the catch. <laughs> I, I would say the word resolve. I, I think we found this out later, but you could tell, and I think Ken could too, when you were around that team, that 98 team, 97, 98 mm -hmm. season team, there was, they were just playing out this a, a string of 82 games, if that makes any sense. I mean, they were a great team. They knew they were mm -hmm. going to make the playoffs. They just wanted to get into the playoffs. They wanted to re repeat as Stanley Cup champions. They wanted to do it for uh, for Sergey uh, Vladdy and to a lesser degree for Tisov too. But I mean, but you know, they had the patch and all that, and, and that's what I really remember: just the quiet resolve that that team had. And then once the playoffs began, the momentum that they had built up and the way that they, you know, kind of cruised through through the playoffs. So that that's really what I kind of remember. But as I said, my memory was more based after talking to them. Because if you talk to anybody, and I know Kenny has uh, from the 98 team, they'll tell you the regular season really was meaningless. We knew we were good. We just wanted to get to the playoffs. And once they got to the playoffs, they proved just how good they were. All right, now we've got a baseball question for you. Thanks to our friends at Fox Sports Detroit. Right. We're actually going to be able to see some Tigers throwback no hitters this week. So, this question, it's a good connection here. Which Tigers pitcher do you think is closest to throwing a no-hitter or really which pitcher will be next for the Tigers? The next Tiger pitcher to throw a no-hitter? Well, I'm going to go with a starter, obviously. Uh, I, you know, I, I can break it down very, very quickly, as you can tell. You know, Matt Boyd threw a one-hitter. You would think that he would be the obvious choice. I look at Jordan Zimmerman, and, and I'm thinking to myself, uh, you know, he kind of reminds me of that, uh, you know, for the love of the game. Wasn't a great movie by uh, Detroit's own Sam Raimi, which starred Kevin Costner as Billy Chappell, who's, uh, you know, on the final legs of his career and throws a throws a perfect game, actually. You know, so I'm, I'm thinking, is it Jordan Zimmerman or could it be Daniel Norris? Daniel Norris is obviously, he was the crown jewel of that deal for David Price. I mean, Matt Boyd came over too. Norris has had some injuries. Will Daniel Norris finally live up to his potential? Not is it Daniel Norris or is it Ivan Nova? You know, kind of the workman like pitcher. You know, you never know with Ivan Nova, you know, he's going to give you a bunch of innings. Will he have that special game or will it be Spencer Turnbull? Guy that I love, I just love Spencer Turnbull. I think he has an arsenal of pitches. I think that when he's on, you know, he can strike people out. I really, really like Spencer uh, uh, Turnbull. I almost said Spencer Torkelson. Uh, but, uh, but I, 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 yeah, who knows? Maybe the kid can pitch. He's a one, one, right? Um, I really think out of all of it, when I really, really think about it, cause baseball is such a strange and funny game. And maybe this goes with talking to Armando Galarraga a few weeks ago or whatever. I think it's Yvonne Nova. I think Yvonne Nova out of nowhere is going to come out and throw a no hitter for the Tigers. I just think he's going to grab the ball. Whatever, everything is aligning, the moon, the stars, you know, uh, uh, the tide, all that kind of stuff. And I think, I actually, I'm going to go off the board a little bit. I, In my heart, it says Spencer Turnbull, but I really do think it's Yvonne Nova. I think that's going to happen. 
I like that art. That's an interesting choice. I thought you were going to go solid with Matt Boyd there for a minute, but I, I like your choice. I like that. And Ken, I have been waiting to ask you this question, and I think everyone's going to really enjoy your answer. This is Sean from Commerce. The Wings won Best TikTok in the Fan Choice Awards. Is there any chance Ken Kale can do a TikTok dance for us? <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, back in the day, I did the Ganyam style, you know, and uh, that was a hit. I oh, think we did yeah. it at one of the season ticket holder parties. And uh, that's on video somewhere. Uh, I think Rick Bonus, who used to work for the Red Wings, has it on video, and every now and then he'll send it to me just as a laugh. But uh, I don't know if I can learn the dance steps. Who knows? Maybe I would do something like that. I think we could teach you. There's a few easy ones. I think we, we could get you on TikTok for sure. That's only a 10 second dance though, right? About, yeah. They're really not any longer than that. We could get you on there. Honestly, we should have both of you do it. You can do it together. That would be a great TikTok for the Red Wings TikTok even. Well, be something you know, different. I knew it Are one time. Yeah, you know, yeah, I, I, 15 seconds of Ken and I dancing together. I, 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 people are clamoring for that. Uh, what I think though is that Ken's being <laughs> modest as usual. Uh, you know, he had golden locks, as I said, in the 70s. His middle name for a long time was Macarena because that's what he loved to do. He, he was a big Macarena fan. And so, you know, and, you know, actually, when I think about it, maybe because the Macarena was done by those two dudes, right? They were kind of dancing. Hey, Macarena. I think Ken and I could do a TikTok to Macarena, but, uh, but, but we'll see. Right. There you go. I told you he knew it. I mean, that Ken was a Macarena guy. <laughs> Boy, that was really a long one. time ago. <laughs> I'm gonna find I'm one. I'm surprised I'll no one's done it. Yeah. <laughs> you guys could do it. All right, let's get to our fourth question, you guys. And Art, we're gonna start with you. Phil from Warren asks, "What is a better baseball at home game, stick ball or wiffle ball?" Well, you know, again, I, I to me, stickball is a game that's played in the city, like New York City or Chicago. But like in New York City, like the, you know, like the dead end kids are Bowery boys, right? I mean, I've never played stickball in my life. Plus, I always thought it was played with a Super Bowl, a uh, Super Bowl, which is really hard. And yeah, I, I think that's dangerous. Without question, for me, it's wiffle ball. Wiffle ball is the game to play. I mean, you know, it's easy to hit. It's slow. Kids can get their timing down. Uh, I, I really think that it's wiffle ball. Stick ball to me, again, I mean, it's it was played with a broomstick and a hard ball. I just don't, uh, I just don't see that translating well in a small enclosed Comerica Park where, you know, kids are just taking like these like Super Bowl things, you know, Super Bowl is really, really hard, condensed rubber, and just like nailing people with it. I think let's be safe. Let's be smart about this. Wiffle ball. All right, Ken, what do you think? Well, I agree with Art. I never played stickball in my life, and uh, I know it was a big game out in New York, and as Art mentioned, usually played it in the street in the city. Growing up, in uh, Detroit, on the west side of Detroit, we used to play wiffle ball, but we called it alley ball because we played in the alley behind the house. And if you had to hit the ball straight uh, in order to get a hit, and if you hit it in anybody's yards uh, and it was a co closely confined alley, then you were out. So it forced you to hit the ball straight. And uh, it was hard to do. And of course, when you were pitching, you had a really big arsenal because you could throw that wiffle ball, especially if it had holes in it, you know, any which way, in shoots, oh, yeah. curves, sliders, everything. And, um, you know, the, the harder you threw it, uh, you know, the better it was because you didn't know as a hitter where it was going to be. But, you know, I think for the kids in today's today's world, I think wiffle ball is the, uh, is the sport here in Detroit for kids growing up. It certainly was back in the day when I was growing up on the west side of Detroit. Hey, not not to brag or anything, but I was the wiffle ball champion of my neighborhood as a kid. I actually heard that Spencer Torkelson modeled his game after me. So just have to let you guys know that. Now, wow. wait a minute, Daniela. Uh, you didn't use that big wow, baseball man. bat. Oh, the one that wow. kids little kids. Always... What was that, Ken? 
I said, you didn't use that big baseball bat that those like six-year-olds have, you know, the one that looks like a Freddie Flintstone uh, yeah. big barrel bat. I wasn't allowed to. They wouldn't let me use that bat because I was too good. We had a league like within our subdivision. I was like, more big hitter. yeah, I did. I, I was pretty good. Nice. I was pretty good. So yeah, all the kids should play wiffle ball. That's what I'm saying here. It was a lot of fun. That's, that's the best at home baseball game. And Ken, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here because one of our YouTube yep. viewers asked for a uh, he shoots, he scores from Ken Cal. So can you give us one live right now? What's the guy's name? Um, let me take a look here. What was his name? Uh, Trent Fury. There we go. Bob. Oh, Trent Fury. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, well, this is for old time's sake, I guess. Trent, I hope you're listening and hope you're watching. Uh, we'll go old school here. Here's Eisenman up the right side. What was his name again? Trent? Trent. Trent Fury. Trent Leary, right? Okay. Here's <laughs> Eisenman down the middle of the ice. Pass over on the left wing to Lidstrom, who drops it back. Trent Leary moves in with a shot. He scores! And the Red Wings win the Stanley Cup. <laughs> oh, look at that. For the Stanley Cup, too. That's awesome. That, that was great. Well, thank you, Ken. And thank go you so big. much for joining us, as always. For the mailbag wow. we'll have you back really soon always a pleasure <laughs> and a big thank you to our friends at little caesars too for delivering us the mailbag this week and every week little caesars proudly introduces their hot and ready pepperoni cheeser cheeser you get a large pizza topped with classic pepperoni fresh mozzarella a toasted parmesan and asiago cheese crust for just seven dollars try our no contact pizza portal or delivery from Little Caesars. You guys, we've still got a jam-packed show for you. Dan Dickerson is going to join us, former Red Wings goalie Kevin Hudson, and as well as Matt Shepard. But right now, we're going to check in with Carly Johnston. Thanks, Daniela. That's right. It is time for Catching Up with Carly, presented by Meyer. Today, I'm lucky enough to be joined by Billy Bean, former Tiger and current VP and special assistant to the commissioner. How's it going, Billy? I'm doing great, Carly. I'm really happy to be here with you today. Love it. Well, let's get started and let's start with your position in the league. What kind of duties does the vice president and special assistant to the commissioner have? Well, I kind of wear a lot of hats, to be perfectly honest. I was hired uh, in 2014, uh, early in 2014, as MLB's very first ambassador for inclusion. And we'll get into my backstory a little bit. But my job now, um, I was... Uh, instrumental in offering my ideas um, on some really uh, important initiatives and education uh, ideas that uh, were embraced and I was moved up into a position where now I oversee um, a great team of people um, in our player program education. I do keep the commissioner um, abreast and posted on all things LGBTQ that are happening in the world, outside social responsibility uh, uh, conversations that are happening um, in every way. So like what's happening, uh, the cultural um, conversations and protests that have been happening the last couple of weeks, uh, those types of things I keep my eye very closely on and I try to keep um, uh, him as aware of the things outside of the baseball, you know, structure as possible, because there is a huge responsibility that goes um, with our great sport. And, and uh, I integrate, I oversee and started a bullying prevention education program called Shred Hate. We partnered up with ESPN, um, a great program. We've been in front of almost 200,000 students in our MLB cities in only three years. Uh, a military uh, employment program. Um, so a lot of different things that uh, really about broadening our awareness um, and that focus and center on fostering the most inclusive, respectful and accepting workplace that we can in our clubhouses, in our front offices and in our game day experience for our fans. That's incredible. That's very important for a <laughs> professional sports league to have. But how important is it to promote and ensure inclusivity across the entire league? Well, I think when I started, there was maybe a percentage of people in sports that thought that that was like a novelty. Um, you know, the world has changed a lot. And 2014 was a very interesting year. Um, if you look at corporate America and the shift the better understanding 
uh, about um, chief diversity officers all of a sudden started appearing and, and you know, in global international companies because there was a better understanding about how important um, diversity and inclusion is and, and being represented um, by voices and images and, and cultural backgrounds that are more diverse, you have an opportunity to put those assets together, leverage those and create a better product. I love you sharing your story because this is something personal uh, you may have dealt with. You spoke about earlier as a former baseball player coming out as gay. How hard was that to be in that kind of community? So in a century and a half, only two major league baseball players that ever played in the major leagues have ever publicly disclosed that they were gay. Um, and so by anyone's estimation or math ability, those odds probably don't honestly represent or reflect how many you know people like me played their whole careers and never told anybody because they were a baseball player first and that's the way i thought of myself too the hardest part about my career that i remember is that right when i was reaching the pinnacle of everything i'd worked for my whole life emotionally everything was unraveling off the field and baseball is a very hard sport and I never gave my teammates, I never gave baseball a chance to maybe support me by talking about it. I just felt um, that someone like me probably didn't belong in baseball. It was, it was a really, really long, slow, arduous learning process uh, because I chose to try to do that all by myself. I appreciate you sharing your story with us and someone else you shared your story with. Uh, you helped counsel David Dunson, who became the first minor league player assigned to an MLB organization to come out as gay. So right. seeing that, do you have hope for continuous progression and self-acceptance? Sure. I think I think in David's case, he was 100% A plus on the self-acceptance scale, which was different for me. And mm -hmm. I... I I really feel like that is uh, the result of so many people in my community and allies like yourself that are um, supportive and the messaging that goes out there that and David was really, really felt strongly that it was the best decision for him to do. Um, at that time, I was um, I was like an uncle, big brother to him, you know, where he would text me all the time. And, you know, there's. There is a pervasive um, feeling that every athlete, especially in baseball, in the minor leagues, where you're a professional, but you feel kind of far away from what you're seeing on TV, and and uh, and it can get a little lonely, and it's tough because there's a lot of players, there's a lot of teams that you have to move through the ranks to make the major leagues, and um, you know your your teammates become very important to you. But I think the one thing that he did not understand at the time was that he was so new into baseball that it was easy for the outside people in baseball looking at him as a gay person playing baseball instead of a baseball player that just happened to be gay. And that is a very, very tricky um, um, acceptance curve for people that don't know you. So you touched on this a bit, but um, June being Pride Month and with the Black Lives Matter movement happening, do you think more people are opening their eyes to prejudice that can surround sports and athletes? And do you think athletes are using their platform correctly to promote change? I always started like every one of, of my presentations, you know, that we are the sport of Jackie Robinson. If we weren't, if Jackie Robinson hadn't broke the color barrier um, and helped us understand why education about racism um, is so important that there would never be a conversation about LGBT. It wouldn't be a, a conversation about sexism. It's the core for you know these important conversations. And now all conversations about diversity, in my opinion, begin with understanding systemic racism, respecting women in the workplace, and then the opportunity to bring conversations about LGBT acceptance and better understanding about what that is and what it means and and. Um, this is this is part of my job. This is where I work when we talk about educating the players to give them the tools and resources to make decisions that they understand, you know, and then we, we could talk for two days about, you know, the, the effects of social media and everyone having a platform. 
It's like having a, a rocket or an airplane and not knowing how to fly. You know, it's like you just can't get in there and start, you know, because you are representing something bigger than yourself. You're representing your family. You're representing where you come from. You're representing your team, your organization. You're representing your league. You're representing people that, that look like you, that, that look up to you. Um, these are multi-tiered um, sort of revelation sometimes. We have a great program called Ahead and Account for that's a minor league education program. And you know, the assumption that every kid knows what LGBTQ plus means, that's that's like that would be selfish of me. With that, what are some initiatives you are working on with the MLB specifically for Pride Month this month? So my intention and with the great team of people that you know but we have what are called business resource groups and uh, we have an MLB Pride uh, business resource group that focuses on these kinds of activations. Um, and with all that in mind, um, I wanted to have an education-based narrative. We have an education partner called PFLAG, which was started almost 45 years ago. It's Parents and Friends of Lesbian and Gays, the way it was named in 1973. But it's uh, an ally-based family and friends of, of, of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, they're a great education partner. They're bipartisan. It's not a political organization. Um, and we have uh, an amazing woman who is going to give us an LGBTQ uh, history uh, conversation um, focusing on our LGBTQ plus heroes of color over the last 50 years. So we're going to um, highlight some brave uh, pioneers, um, and have a, a really candid conversation and that happens. Uh, and of course it's all virtual right now. And then um, I'm gonna moderate a panel of four out executives at MLB that work for uh, teams. Um, I, th I thought uh, the title is working out at MLB um, and I'm gonna let them share their, their business journey, uh, their life journey, and really the responsibility of being an, uh, a role model amongst their colleagues because it's so much better than it used to be. But there's still, as a very, very low number of, of people that are out um, in pro sports in the workplace. Um, and what I think my goal is to really highlight uh, these individuals so that they can become uh, influential in helping people that are a part of the community see baseball um, as, um, a, a professional option. And this is, you know, what every athlete is. We're human beings and there's a chance to um, find connections. I think I'm a really good uniter. I bring people together. I'm not trying to point fingers and expect the, the, the players to be experts in social issues. Um, I want to be an, an, an educator and a teacher and I, wanna, I want it to be interesting and, and meaningful. Um, and for me to accomplish that, I need to do my homework. I need to be prepared and I need to come in and, and be able to communicate in a way that they're receptive to. Well, Billy, we all need to do our homework to be better people and to make the sports community more accepted. Um, I can't thank you enough for joining me on Catch Me <laughs> Carly presented by Meyer. And I pledge you to help make the sports community 100% inclusive. Well, and I hope I we're going to cross paths soon. I, I, I want to come back. This is great. Yeah, let's come back. I'll come back next year and we'll talk about all the things that we did from this amazing moment in time and history and all the work that we're doing forward because we got to do the work. We can't just talk about it. So thank you exactly. very, very much. Uh, go Tigers. I love the Tigers organization. They're my hometown. You're my very first team. Uh, I'll never forget those, uh, those days. It was such an honor and privilege to play in Detroit. And I think so fondly of, of them and I wish everybody well, and I hope the Tigers have a great year. They just drafted an amazing baseball player and number one pick a couple nights ago. So uh, wish everyone well there. And Carly, anytime I want, you can have me on your show if you want me to be, okay? Love it. Billy, thank you so much. <laughs> take care. All right, you guys take care, be well. Okay. Thank you so much. And thanks for tuning in to Catching Up with Carly presented by Meyer, back to you. 
Thank you, Carly. And thank you, Billy. It was so amazing for Billy to get on there and share his story, which is always something that's hard to talk about, something that's hard to bring to the surface. But I think he's doing amazing things. And when he said that he wants to be an educator, I think that is the most important thing in art. I think you can agree with me that everybody needs to be a little bit more educated about this and that children even need to be taught about inclusivity and, and accepting people for who they are. So it's great to see what Billy's doing. And I'm so happy that we get to stand behind a movement like that. Well, I couldn't agree with you more, Carly. I mean, obviously, I remember Billy Bean as a tiger, as an actual are. player. I know, <laughs> but you know what? But, but, but I, I will say this: the Supreme Court ruling yesterday, uh, which uh, gives uh, uh, you know everyone's inclusive now. I mean, you know, and, and, and I really enjoy that. I, I, the thing I took out of that was how alone and isolated he felt mm -hmm. when he wasn't comfortable to in his own skin to talk about himself and try to do something about it, that has to be the worst feeling in the world when you feel you have nobody. And, you know, mm -hmm. he obviously is the best player person, I should say, to, to be in this role. You could tell he truly is convicted about it. He understands it and he's willing to help people. So, uh, uh, I, I just thought that was an, a very, very good segment. Uh, I, I think it, uh, you know, gives you a, a little bit of insight. And, you know, and, and Billy Bean, instead of sheltering himself, he really took how negative and lonely and isolated he felt and has really turned it into something extraordinary. Really, uh, uh, really interesting job and another good job by Carly. I mean, that was, uh, that was a great interview and, uh, you know, I think that's something that we can all embrace. And uh, Billy Bean, keep fighting the good fight, as they say. Art, I couldn't agree with you more. It was it was great to hear from him. And having these conversations could be the hardest part of it, but that's the biggest part of it. So the fact that we are starting to have these conversations and making people aware and making sure that people are educated about these subjects is huge. And I think we are headed in the right direction with all of this. And Carly, you did so great with that interview. That was amazing. Great job. And we've got to welcome you back for Bet You Didn't Know, presented by Motor City Casino Hotel. But I have to ask you first, how awesome was it to actually talk to Billy? Because we all need perspective sometimes and we all need to be taught certain things. So how was it actually talking with him and learning a little bit about this subject? It was amazing. It was really insightful to get to talk to him. He's so well-spoken and there are a lot of things that um, we couldn't keep in the show. Like my questions that I had to ask that he had to keep it obviously to a certain time, but I just had so many questions for him that I wanted to ask. And luckily I have his contact information, so I may ask offline, but it was so awesome to get to talk to him and really see the movements they're making across the league uh, to make everything and everyone and the whole league itself inclusive. And like you said, accepting someone for who they are. Right. Right. It, it was great. Great to hear from him, Carly. That was awesome. I hope we do have him back soon. But now we're going to get into Bet You Didn't Know. And I know Art has something up his sleeve again today. So I can't say okay. I'm really looking forward to it. But take it away, Art. <laughs> well, this is uh, this is a real interesting one. As we know, a week from this coming Friday is the NHL draft lottery. As a matter of fact, I'm going to hold up something mm -hmm. that I don't know if you two are familiar with. This is a calendar. And as oh, you can tell, I use, I use this. And, 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 yeah, well, I know you're always on your phones. You can see I had NHL draft Montreal. I was really looking forward to that. Uh, Andrew, uh, Bossman, Christoph, and I were going to hang out with the BT Express, uh, Big Tony. Uh, he's I, from Montreal. <laughs> As you can tell, it's gone. It's gone. But I do have draft lottery written underneath. So I was inspired mm -hmm. by the draft lottery for this one, Bet You Didn't Know. So, you know, I, I suggest, okay. you you know, all young people out there, pick up a calendar sometimes. It's kind of cool. It's it, They're kind of neat. I, I, I know they're not around that much anymore. There every Tuesday and Thursday. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> Do you really? All right. Well, look, I, I, I'm kind of freaking out there. All right. Here we go. <laughs> that, that's the best I've looked in a long time. Trust me. Uh, <laughs> all right. The Red Wings is in the draft lottery. They have an 18.5% chance of getting the first round pick. So this is today's, but you didn't know. What? is greater than an 
18.5% chance of happening. Not owning a cell, a smartphone, a person has a tattoo they regret, or being an only child. So let me explain it again. One of these is greater than 18.5%. Two are not, meaning that, you know, and the Red Wings have that have that 18.5%. Which one of these is greater than 18.5%? Uh, a, a chance mm -hmm. of happening. Not only in a smartphone, a person has a tattoo they regret, which I'm sure Daniela can relate to, and also <laughs> not being an only child. You know what? Who's going first, Art, for that one? Who's going first? Well, well, you know what? Carly, you're still batting a thousand, and I, I guess I Daniela's up to about 250. <laughs> so you two decide. I don't want to get in between you two. No, you have to pick. It's part of the job of being the moderator yeah, of this. Of oh. no, well, okay. All right, then. I am going to go with Daniela first. Wow. All right. Well, I seriously, this is tough. Um, I'm going to say it's not being an only child. I'm eliminating that one. So for me, it's between the tattoos and the smartphone. Oh man, I'm I'm doing eeny meeny miny mo in my head again. Hang on, give me five seconds. All right, all right, all right. I got it. We're gonna go with not owning a smartphone, which I don't know if I feel like that's the right answer, but I'm gonna go with it because that's what I landed on. All right, so okay. you think there's a greater I'm than eighteen point five percent chance? You're gonna go. I'm being going with accounting. Yeah. I'm talking, I think that, I think it's a tattoo. I don't know. I just feel like a lot of people regret their tattoos. Not all, it's not all, you know, having their ex's name tattooed on them. Sometimes it's just a bad tattoo that wasn't well done or something that they don't really like anymore. Maybe they got when they were 18 years old, you know? Yeah. Like, I, I, our, you, you know, know I, I've heard. That tattoo you have know, on your I, I am, uh, <laughs> no, you know what? As a matter of fact, I don't have any piercings or tattoos. Why would I want to mess with perfection? Let's be honest. Yeah, you know, your body is a tumble, all right. Is, Lots of right, right. Ferrari. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's exactly right. So yeah, I, I look at it now. Uh, Carly, do you, now Carly, do you have tattoos that you regret? I I don't have any that I regret, but I do have <laughs> tattoos. I do. Really, you have so tattoos. No regret. You're the only one that doesn't have a tattoo, Art. Yeah, you're the yeah, you're the well, oddball. That's, that's, the closest I've ever come to anything like that was to get an ear piercing. But, you know, back then, there was no place <laughs> open. You know, I was feeling really happy. You know, my friends had talked me into it. And several of them do actually have piercings. But, again, I think tattoos was a generational thing. If I were a sailor, of course, I would have gotten a, a tattoo with a heart and with mom on my, you know, forearm or something like that. But, uh, you know, tattoos were not really, really big when I was coming through, you know, we were, we were more interested yeah. in, you know, in the, in the environment, you know, being, being good citizens, not, not, not so totally it, engrossed okay. in ourselves, but adored our body with tattoos. I'm not anti-tattoo though. What's that one right now? <laughs> all right. Hey, yeah, you, you guys are getting off. What's the answer? All right. All right. Here, here you go. <laughs> what is greater than an 18.5% uh, chance of happening? Daniela, congratulations. It's not owning a cell phone. There you go. Oh, my gosh. Or a smartphone, I should say. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, 23% well, of people still use it. a flip phone. Yeah, that go was ahead. my thought process. Like the phone? older population. My grandma has well, a I flip phone still. Is, so that's what I'm about. All my grandparents have <laughs> iPhones. Exactly. My grandpa is very keen about his iPhone. Well, see, now, now, this is what's interesting about this. I think anybody below the age of four probably doesn't have any kind of phone. And that's oh, a huge part of our population. And then people that are, people that are a little bit older uh, probably are comfortable mm -hmm. with their flip phones. So this is it. 23% of the uh, population uh, still use a flip phone or don't have one at all. Uh, yeah, I like what our producer Mark told us that, hey, look, that means 23% of the people are watching our show on their computer and so you know so the flip phone smartphone now listen 15 percent chance of a person uh 15 percent chance of people having a tat 
of having a tattoo, the odds of having a tattoo are 20% in America. That means that 3% of all Americans have a tattoo they regret. And then being an only child, there's only a 5% chance that you can be an only child. Even if you're an only child, though, the amount of first cousins, the average amount of first cousins that, that we have is five. So that still means you might be an only child, but you still have a pretty good you know, family unit. I mean, first cousins are almost like brothers and sisters in a in a certain way. So, uh, so there you have it. Now, Carly, I th I think your streak is over, unfortunately. And uh, Daniela, I think uh, you know, not only the first question I got wrong. Yeah, it is, it is the first street. question you got wrong. Yeah. So, Carly, I don't know. You're about like batting nine hundred or something. And uh, Daniela, you're up to about. Mm -hmm. 275. So, I mean, that's uh, All right. that's well, not bad, it. but that's it. Not, <laughs> the, I do want to say, though, that you want is probably skewed a little bit because I bet you there's a lot of people that do have tattoos they regret that won't admit it if I had to again, if I had to well, guess. That's true. <laughs> yeah. I, I, that's think true well. you, I, I think the older you, I think the older, I think the older you get probably because of the way your body probably shifts and changes. Mm -hmm. Some tattoos are definitely going to need to be touched up or taken off altogether. So I think you're right. I think depending on your age uh, uh, for that one, a person has a tattoo uh, that they regret. Yeah. Uh, yes, definitely. Well, that, that was a good one. Art. You, you brought the competition this time. That one was tough. So thank you for that. And thank you to Motor City Casino Hotel for presenting Bet You Didn't Know this week and every week right here on The Word on Woodward. And Carly, I know that you have been all over the social media as always uh, to bring us some content that happened mm -hmm. over the long week. So what do you got for us right now? Thanks, Danielle. That's right. Well, first, I'm going to start with something that's happening later this week. Um, the Detroit Tigers will be having a virtual happy hour this Thursday at 7 p.m. It's going to be fun. It'll be all the, a few of the prospects. Happy hour with Fado, Mannings, Mize, Rogers, hosted by Matt Shepard. So that'll be a good one. Check it out on Tiger social media for more information. Don't miss this. I think it's going to be a blast. And also, Tigers related, just yesterday, pause along with some volunteers donated thousands of locally made masks to people in Detroit through the Detroit Tigers Foundation in partnership with the Cabreras, uh, G1 Impact and Serve Foundation. So that's really cool to see them giving back to the community. Um, and then on the Detroit Tigers end, today is a big day in hockey town history. It has been 22 years since the team won the Stanley Cup in 98. Uh, for the second year in a row, back-to-back -back champs, a moment that for sure stands out. Uh, in the organization and for fans. Um, I'm sure Art remembers this day like it was yesterday, but I was only five, so I don't really remember it. <laughs> Although it's been great to be able to talk to a lot of the alumni and um, have them recount that day with them. That's pretty awesome. But uh, also back to that happy hour, I think we have a video to get you guys excited about it. So take it away. Look at that lineup. Incredible. Again, you guys don't want to miss that. I will be tuning in and I hope to see you guys there. Great lineup. I mean, they look like a fun crew. So why not tune in with a little glass of something? Daniela? Hey, I'm going to be there with you for sure. That was awesome. That video was great. Judging by those moves they had, though, during their media day, they might need to be the ones that do a TikTok for us or something something along those lines. It looked like they had some rhythm there. <laughs> that will be a really cool event, guys. Make sure that you tune in. We've still got a lot coming up on today's show, including Dan Dickerson joining us. We've got interviews with Kevin Hodson, former Red Wings goalie, and Matt Shepard. But right now, you guys, as promised, The Winged Wheel, presented by Bud Light Seltzer. All right, fellas. Now this really is the one tonight. You gotta go out there and take it. Back at the Detroit Olympia. Hand clasps and picture taking all prove how wonderful it feels to be a winner again. They're helping bring our city together and you know I'm just so proud of all of uh, we work together to you. It's beautiful. We can 
continue to be laser focused on building a team for our incredible fans. April 8, 2019, locker room cleanout day at Little Caesars Arena. The Red Wings have finished in seventh place in the Atlantic Division. This gives them the fourth best odds of having the first overall pick in the upcoming NHL entry draft. During what was a challenging season, two bright spots emerged, forwards Dylan Larkin and Tyler Bertuzzi, who both took steps in their professional development. You know, it, it's a long season, it's 82 games. You have to, you have to prove it every game and every night, and um, you have to learn how to do that. And, and I think each year, you know, each game, we're, we're learning and, and we're building for that, and, and hopefully next year we can uh, you know, put it all together and, and really you know, take, a, take a grab of it. It's one thing to, you know, not be in a, in a playoff spot and, um, you know, kind of kind of suck to, to lose at home um, in our last game, and, you know, we just got to move forward. And, you know, I learned a lot this season. Um, it was my first full season, so um, there's a lot to learn from, and, you know, I thought it went pretty well. Like I said, anything, there's a lot of ups and downs, and it's just a, it's a, little, a learning curve. The draft lottery occurs at the end of the regular season and determines the order of the draft. The teams with the worst records hold the best chances of claiming the top selections, and the Red Wings hold the fourth best odds of getting the first pick overall. However, for the second year in a row, luck doesn't favor the Wings, as they slide down two positions to the sixth pick overall. Days later, the Red Wings would dramatically change the direction of the franchise when it was announced that the captain, Steve Eiserman, is returning to Hockey Town to become the new general manager and executive vice president. Eiserman, who since 2010 had led the Tampa Bay Lightning as a constant threat to challenge for the Stanley Cup, and most recently, a president's trophy for regular season best record. You like to say to the fans, here on day one of your job with the Red Wings as a general manager. I'm taking over for Ken Holland, who has been one of the most successful general managers the last 25, probably the most successful general manager the last 25 years in this league, who has done a fantastic job. They are difficult jobs. Regardless of what people think good, bad, and different of me as, during my playing career, it doesn't make me a good GM, doesn't make me a bad GM. But for our fans, it's difficult. I was drafted in 1983. It took till 97, we won a cup. A lot of things have to happen to go. It's really difficult and it took a while. And you know, the Red Wings won in the 50s. You know, there, it, there's cycles and it takes a while and it's difficult and there's no guarantees. So we just, you know, everyone in Detroit is still pretty fresh, fresh winning a cup in, in 08. You know, good memories, it's hard to do it. And it's, I just say, look, this is gonna take some time, I believe, this or, you know, with the Illiches owning the team, they're committed. They want to win as bad as every single fan does. And they'll do whatever they have to to get there. And I'm hoping I can add to that and, and expedite the process. But we need some patience. And, uh, you know, me coming in it isn't just going to turn this thing around overnight. It's not going to be one good off season here and away we go. It's, I've learned it's a process. And having done it again for eight seasons in Tampa, it's, it's hard and at times it's very frustrating because you want to do things, you have all these ideas. 30 other teams have ideas too and they're, you know, and it's just really difficult. In late June, Eiserman delivers on his first opportunity to make an impact on the future of the organization. At the 2019 NHL entry draft in Vancouver, Eiserman surprises the hockey world with his sixth overall selection. With the sixth pick in the draft, the Detroit Red Wings select from Mannheim with the DEL, Moritz Seider. You can hear the reaction here in this arena. He said, just, just be calm and enjoy the moment because my hands were so shaking, I was so sweaty. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just a fun experience being yeah. here. I mean, Mannheim and, and Detroit, I think they had a lot in common. They're both worker cities, so I think that's definitely going to be easy. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to being in uh, Detroit. I would say a smart two-way defenseman who loves to join the rush, um, creating space for his teammates, but also is not afraid to play the body on the ice, I would say. Obviously, at uh, his position, it's, it's not easy to build what he built there and, and finding the right pieces, but you know, knowing where we are today, I think if he can bring in more 
you know, players through the draft, you know, bring back his experience and share it with guys like myself and uh, Tyler Bertuzzi and Anthony Mantha and Andreas Anthony Siu. It's just going to help us, uh, you know, in our careers and, and uh, help us as uh, people and players. Traverse City, Michigan has been the home of the Red Wings training camp since 1997. That same year, the NHL Prospects Tournament debuted. The tournament, designed to showcase the top prospects of the seven clubs who joined the host Red Wings prior to opening their own training camps for the upcoming season. You know, we got to go there early to Traverse City and sort of uh, see the landscape and then through testing and things like that, you sort of uh, bond through that. Um, some practice there, we got to know each other, and then, you know, in a, a short tournament like that, um, chemistry is a huge thing, so I think we were able to, to bond together and um, play really well, so it was really fun. For us, we're playing really good hockey right now. If we keep it the same way, then, you know, we'll be fine. Just wanted more than them, I mean, uh, our competitiveness has to be high tonight. It's going to be a hard game, we got to go for 100% and uh, let's we'll see what's going to happen. We've been getting better every game. These guys are ready to go, it'll be a fun game. Steele up over the line, two on one, developing. Here's Loggins moving in, and he scores! Beautiful! Here's Hiroshi with a shot, he scores! Oh, a good. quick wrestler by Hiroshi makes it 2 to 1 Detroit. Here's Adina with a shot, club save, rebound, scores! Pearson scores the goal! Good job, man. It's fun to win this game, and really looking forward to tomorrow. We have a great team here. Oh, you guys were talking, that's why we came here, we didn't come here to lose. A bunch of good prospects coming to this tournament, and I think that we, we meshed pretty early. The Wings have come up here for, for many, many years, and it, it's a big tournament for the organization. With the Wings tournament record standing at three wins and one loss, only the prospects of the Dallas Stars stand in the way of the Wings capturing their second championship. The last coming in 2013 with Andreas Athanasiu, Anthony Mantha, and Tyler Bertuzzi. Well, we welcome you all, and uh, the puck has dropped atop the center right circle. We're underway in the championship game of the 2019 Prospects Tournament here in Traverse City. Up across the line, got it to the right circle, McLeod with a back in, he scores to Bonnie Smith! Tournament, new tournament rules, that counts as good. <laughs> <laughs> Hiroshi, Boleno with a shot, he scores! Joe Boleno with the goal that gives Detroit a 5-4 to lead. Hardly the save made by Romeo, and the game is over. Now there's Hiroshi and the rest of the team. Raising the cup out at center ice. They are the 2019 Prospect Tournament champions here in Traverse City. Really hard tournament to win, especially when you don't win your first game. So gutsy effort, not on the shot. There you have it, everybody. Episode one of the Winged Wheel presented by Bud Light Seltzer. If you're a member of Winged Wheel Nation, you are able to watch all episodes today. The rest of you will be able to watch all episodes of the Winged Wheel on the Red Wings YouTube channel starting tomorrow. I know I, for one, am really excited to watch the rest of that series. It gives you a great behind the scenes look at the Red Wings season. So well done to our production team that put that together. It's great so far, and I'm excited to see what the rest of it looks like. And now, guys, we're going to get into Brush Street Beat presented by our friends at McLaren Healthcare. And today, we're going to bring in Dan Dickerson. And Dan, we've got a lot to talk about with you because the MLB draft, the 2020 draft, is officially in the books, and the Tigers all across the board have gotten really good grades on all of their draft picks. So to start this off, I just want you to give your analysis of the 2020 draft class. Well, I love it, and I'll always start with a caveat that I, I love looking at draft grades and then looking at them five or six years later to see how they really pan out. You always take a little bit of skepticism, but let's face it, it's fun to see national experts grade this draft basically in the A to A-plus category. The thing that I like the most is that they went after hitting. Hitting is what they really need in this system. A five-round draft meant they really had to concentrate You know how they were going to use their limited number of high brown. when you see here's something that you can look at every time they picked a guy after the obvious number one spencer torkelson 
they were drafting guys who were ranked higher than where they were drafted. So in other words, they were getting good value with every one of their picks. That's how you limit the risk. That's how you increase your chances of hitting on a guy. Dylan Dingler at 38 was ranked 24th. He was ranked in the top 25 by almost everybody. You look at the next round, Daniel Cabrera picked at 62, was ranked in the top 40 by just about everybody. Draft. By contrast, the Baltimore Orioles with that second pick really made a reach for a guy who was, you know, it might be a good hitter, but he was ranked probably 10, 11, 12, so that they could save money there and then sign somebody, maybe and add a little depth at 30. Well, that's not how you do a draft. I mean, they ended up picking up guys who were drafted higher than where they were ranked. So I just think the Tigers in every way did this right. It's position players, it's college guys. These are closest to the major leagues. The track record for the Tigers with college hitters has not been great. And given all that you read about the guys they drafted, they've got a real chance to build a lineup within the next three, four, three, four years. It could be one of the top lineups uh, in the American League. Well, first of all, Double D, I have to give you your props because when I asked you where they were going to go at 38 with that second pick, I thought it might be pitching. They didn't draft the pitcher at all. Shows you what I know. Uh, but uh, but it was a heavy draft on pitching. We both talked about it. You said, and because he was a Buckeye, I didn't pay too much attention. Uh, you said Dylan Diggler, don't, you know, this Ohio State catcher, he's somebody that the Tigers are really, really high on. And lo and behold, that's their pick. I mean, what kind of inside information did you have? Or were you just like the great it's cardiac or something? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I no, but you, I mean, you, you nailed that one. You nailed that one. I mean, you you told us last week that hey, this this catcher <laughs> from Ohio State could be the guy the Tigers are looking at, and and they looked at him, and then to get Cabrera, and then I like this Cold Keith kid too. I mean, uh, what surprised you was it? I, I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I, I I would imagine what surprised you had to be that some of these guys were available when the Tigers were picking. Yeah, absolutely. And again, before the next five picks after Torkelson were guys that were ranked higher than where they drafted him. That's a very good sign. Cruz was the obvious exception. Um, and then, you know, the one high schooler is a guy that many felt had the best tools of a high schooler anywhere just because of his ability to be both a pitcher and a position player. It looks like the Tigers wanted him to be a position player. And then the other surprise, you know, the obvious one was Spencer Torkelson announced as a third baseman, his college teammate, who actually is a third baseman. But for those who criticize that, and I understand the criticism that maybe you're putting too much pressure on a kid to switch from first to third. To me, it was a signal that, hey, that's a tough position to find. I mean, look at Tiger's history. To find that guy who can be your franchise cornerstone third baseman, that's traditionally been very tough to do. And if you think that this guy is athletic enough to be at third base, you don't make that announcement lightly. You are signaling to the world you fulfill a position that's really hard to fill in terms of a good bat and a good glove that was probably the biggest surprise but it was strategic also just signals hey we're thinking outside the box here we're we're drafting athletes and several of these guys can play multiple positions and those multiple position players are extremely valuable in major league baseball right now Dan, you mentioned a little bit earlier that the Tigers could have one of the best lineups in three to four years. When you're looking at the draft class right now. Which guys do you think are on the fast track to the MLB? And really, what is that timeline? For college hitters, the really good ones, the, you know, the Spencer Torkelsons of the world, really it's in a normal time with a normal minor league season, that's a guy who could have started this year in the minor leagues, played a full season next year, and been up in the major leagues at some point next year. I truly believe that. I mean, in terms of starting the clock, maybe be early 2022. That's the kind of timeline. But, you, I mean, a year in the minor leagues and these guys, the really polished, you know, once in a generation, even if he's not that, think of Vaughn last year. was on this year. So for a Torkelson, within a year, year and a half. And then as you go a little bit further down the road, two to three years would not be abnormal. Look at the age. Torkelson's 20. A couple of these other guys are 21. 
uh, might be t turning 22 soon. I mean, but still, you're talking probably a two to three year timeline. The high school guys, I mean, traditionally, that's for the average guy who's going to be a major leaguer, five, six years is not unusual. The great ones like the Riley Greens, who we think is going to be great, that could be a two or three year process. You look at, you know, to me, one of the greatest indicators is still that plate discipline, strikeouts to walks. A guy like Torkelson who walks more than he strikes out, that's a guy who can advance quickly. Go down to his teammate, Gage Workman. Strikes out a lot, doesn't walk as much. That's probably going to be more of a learning curve for him. So those are the little things you can look for. But college hitters come more quickly than the high school guys. Now, Dan, I, I think, again, I, I mean, you're being modest here. I mean, you, not only do you hit Dingler, I, I think last week, if baseball can get their act together, you have the torque man being on the Tigers this year. Remember, you said, hey, what, what to say? Not put him up. Let's see what he can do for like 20 games. I mean, do you think that's a real possibility? I, uh, yeah, you know, after, and I said that sort of tongue in cheek, but not really, knowing that I'm sure that the management of the Tigers is going, well, yeah, nuts. Uh, but still, <laughs> it's, it's one of those years, and it's going to be, you know, about service time, what kind of credit you get for service time. But, um, I mean, clearly that they, they feel that if friend at least from college to the major leagues, I still think, what the heck? I mean, I'm not running the team. It's not my service clock at the start. I still selfishly just want to see this kid. If he's got nowhere else to play, give him a few at bats. Well, well you let's know, talk a little bit about the you... Go ahead, Art. I was just going to say, uh, you know, people have asked me since this draft. I, Tiger fans are wildly ecstatic, you know. Uh, you know, very rarely does a Detroit yeah. team draft and their grades universally. I mean, you know, sometimes they'll get an A, but, you know, they'll throw in, you know, some so, so, some joker out there will say, well, everyone says they did well. Well, I'm going to give them a C plus, you know. But across the board, they've done very, very well. But Tiger fans are now coming to and asking me, what does this mean for Paredes and, and Candelario? And, you know, everybody's a third baseman in this organization now. But I think you kind of hit it on the head. <laughs> this, what this is really saying is, is, that, is that these are all players that can play multiple positions, and you want to have options virtually at every position, and may the best man win, I would assume, has to be the Tigers' philosophy. Yeah, competition's good, right? I mean, it, you got Jake Rogers, and they still believe in Jake Rogers as a catcher of the future because of his defensive abilities. But the offense has been slow to develop in this there that they're working on. Uh, why not a little competition from a guy who's got probably the better bat in terms of upside, but is not probably as accomplished defensively because he's not played catcher as long as Jake Rogers? Competition is good. Isaac Paredes probably is a third base but Perhaps Torkelson can play third base or the outfield. And if he can play both competently as well as first base, like you said, that position flexibility, Gage Workman apparently is athletic enough to play shortstop. Might we see him try there? Sure. Why not? I mean, these are the kinds of things that give you flexibility. And if you've got guys who are more locked into certain positions because of their body type or their athleticism, then you've got a chance to mix and match a little bit. And that kind of flexibility for a manager is huge. Dan, one more question for you really quickly here. We've got one more uh, time for one more question, I should say. You mentioned that competition is good, which I agree with you. It is good. But when you look at the 2020 draft class, how does it complement the past few years draft classes or really the entire prospect pool? Well, I think because the pitching side was pretty loaded. And let's face it, that is the strength of this organization. We talked about that going into the draft. Um, I, You know, it. it some have wondered, does it say something about all those college hitters you drafted last year in terms of what you think of their upside? Maybe, but really you're just trying to, and until those guys prove themselves, you have to make sure that you've got the depth. All you're doing by doing that, by having a lot of position players in your first six picks, increase the chances, what, half or more of, of top prospects don't work out. You're trying to increase your chances that these top prospects you're going to hit on more than you're going to miss on. 
And, and that's what the Tigers are doing. I understand that, you know, some people might look at last year and say, yeah, you did this last year and it didn't work out so great. But I think this year the talent actually overall is better. And secondly, I just think you're trying to make sure that you've got the makings of, of a lineup because you know you've already got the makings of a rotation, really solid rotation for years to come, assuming good health. And now you're trying to address the position player side of things. Well, thank you, Dan, for joining us as always. We'll see you again on Thursday. And as you mentioned earlier, I hope that in four or five years, we're looking back on this draft and still giving it an A because we're all feeling really good about it right now. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know, nice I'm going to say, Double we'll D, Double D, I guess your, your tiger, going back to the old campaign, who's your tiger, has to be Dylan Dingler, though, right? I mean, you called it. You called it, Dan. I mean, that's got to be the guy that you're going to fast track to the majors <laughs> along with Spencer Torkelson, I would imagine. All right. All right. That's my guy. I'll go with that, Art. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> Well, thank you, Dan, and a big thank you to our friends at McLaren Healthcare for presenting Brush Street Beat this week and every week right here on the Word on Woodward Art. That was some great insight from Dan Dickerson. Later in the show, you're going to be joined by Matt Shepard. What are you looking to hear from Matt? Because I know that he's really going to try to dive in deep. So what questions and what are you looking for to get out of the Matt Shepard interview? Yeah, but you know, Matt really does, you know, not that Double D doesn't. I don't want to insinuate anything like that because let's face it, he he called Dylan Dingler. I'm 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 kind of obsessed with that today. But with that said, I I, I really <laughs> want to see, you know, Matt kind of break it down. You know, Matt Matt Matt's an old radio dog like I am, and you know, you do a lot of research, you cover all the sports. So when he goes and he looks and he sees a team. And, you know, and he's watched the Tigers for years now and now being the uh, the television broadcaster, he has a really good feel for this organization. So I want to ask him about each individual player, I think, more or less, and how he sees them fitting in and, you know, kind of an overview uh, of the organization that way. I mean, I, I, I because, as I said, you know, he lives and breathes this stuff uh, and, uh, you know, he's really uh, he's really into the draft. I mean, when you, when, you know, when you do a radio show, uh, trust me, the draft is a lot of material, whether it's the NBA draft, the NHL draft, Major League Baseball draft, and of course the NFL draft is king. So um, you really, really get into the draft. And, and I know Matt is really into this draft. I know he's really into these six picks. So I think I want to focus in on that. We're looking forward to that interview art that will be coming up later for the headliner. But right now we're going to talk some Red Wings hockey. All right, everybody, let's get into Downtown Hockey Town, presented by Labatt Blue Light. Today's guest is former Red Wings goaltender, Kevin Hodson. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to see you. How have you been? Uh, thanks for having me. You know, it's been, uh, it's been great. Um, I have, my family's doing well, especially with what's happening, you know, with this coronavirus, so I can't complain. Kevin, it's actually a special day in history for you. On this date in 1993, you signed with the Detroit Red Wings. And I'm going to start this yeah. off by asking you about your NHL debut against the Chicago Blackhawks. We actually had Scotty Bowman on the show last week. And I hear you have a funny Scotty Bowman story of when you made your NHL debut that day. So can you tell us the story? Yeah, you know what it was? Uh, I, I can kind of remember a little bit of it. I, I was at the plancher train. We had played Pittsburgh the night before, and uh, I got put into the game halfway through. Ended up getting a shutout in that half game. And then in the morning, the next day, I got a phone call uh, from Dave Lewis, and he had said that uh, you're going to play today. So I immediately, I think, got sick and uh, hung up the phone. I couldn't believe it. And at that time, my mom and my sister were actually flying in uh, to come and watch me play. And then it was actually really a, a, a kind of a, a neat story with Scotty. So right before the game, he called me in and he just said, listen, you know, I've said this same speech to some of the famous goalies that I've coached throughout my, my lifetime. This is, you know, about you today and, and just have fun, go with it and uh, just enjoy the, the moment because you are now a National Hockey League player and you've earned the right to, to have this to have this moment. And um, obviously winning 3 nothing and just being able to, experience you know the joe lewis crowd and and the arena um, and then to you know to get a shout out your first nhl game was just uh, something i still remember to this day and uh then after the game it was kind of funny i was with dino cicerelli and scotty uh, was talking to the media he was even talking to art at the time but said uh 
yeah, that that uh, Kenny Hodson's not a bad uh, not a bad debut for Kenny Hodson. So when he called me a different name, I was kind of concerned. <laughs> but Dino said that was actually a good. Dino said it was a good thing. So uh, so that was my uh, that was my first uh, NHL game and my NHL story. You know, the one thing that I wanted to ask you about was that as much of a jokester, we're definitely going to get into the uh, the lighter side of your career, shall we say? Sure. But you were you were always a realist. I mean, you knew what your position was, and that you yeah. tried to make yourself valuable to the team in ways that might not translate on the ice. You know what? I, I mean, that's a it's a good point. I, I think uh, what I learned looking back at my career, you know, some people would question, you know, well, did you you want to be a number one goaltender? And the answer was, I think all of us wanted to be number one goaltenders, but. I kind of found a niche for myself uh, of being a backup to to Chris and to being a third third goalie with Chris and Mike. And listen, those two guys are Hall of Fame goaltenders. Um, I think they're they were fantastic. Um, definitely a lot more skilled than me and and more talented than me. Uh, and I recognized that and I realized that. So for me, I, I I felt that I was actually a really good backup. I really embraced that role. I felt that I. Um, I had a good read on the room of, of what to add and what to bring. Um, and I, I tried to do different things uh, to add to add value to the team and to the team dynamics. And um, I thought I did it really well. And I got to a point where I felt that I could play you know, very well every couple of weeks or three weeks. And I, I felt that that was a good role for me and a good niche for me. And um, I think it backfired, I think, at the end of my career because – you know, there. You know, you get labeled as well. This guy just wants to be a backup, or this guy's not good enough to be a starter. But I felt that, my, you know, playing for Detroit and the role that I had, I thought it was a really good role for me, and I thought I embraced it and I did very well in it. Kevin, as a part of your time in Detroit, you were part of the '97 Stanley Cup team. Brought the Stanley Cup back to Detroit for the first time in over 40 years. That's special within itself. And as you said, you were playing behind guys like Ozzy and uh, Mike Vernon. What was it yeah. like playing with that team, though, as a whole? Not only those two guys, because I'm sure you learned a lot from them, but that team was spectacular. So what was it like being a part of all of that? You know, it was surreal, to be honest. You're skating around with, you know, Iserman and Larry Onoff and Shanahan, Murphy, Coffey, Cicerelli, the list goes on and on, Slav Fetisov. Fedorov at, at, at the time was at his prime. Um, and then guys like Mike Vernon and Chris Os Osgood and who, you know, Ozzy was a backup that year, if you can even believe that. So I've actually taken a lot of what I've learned in that dressing room with those type of guys. And I've actually put it into my professional practice life of just how they were so committed to excellence, um, the process that they had, the work ethic, the drive, the accountability. You know, to this day, we, we, when, we, when I still talk to these you know, to all of my old teammates, we're still friends. And, and I, we all had roles on that team. Uh, we all had a huge mutual respect for each other. We all respected our individual talents and what we all brought to that team. But every, uh, every week it was just fun to be there. Uh, there was lots of different stories, lots of things happening. Um, but, you know, we were like the New York Yankees at the time. I and mean, we'd go on road trips and half of the, you know, the stadiums would be Red Wing jerseys. It was just unbelievable to see. Um, I didn't see many of Hudson jerseys, but uh, I had to get my families to travel with me. But you know, uh, I did see a lot. Of, I did see a lot of Red Wing jerseys in the stands. Put it that way. Well, let's talk a little bit about some of the practical jokes that you played. I my all time favorite, and I don't know if you remember this, Mark Bergevin, who's now the general manager yeah. of Canadians, put you on a flat board and dressed you up <laughs> like Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> and and, and, and yeah. I, I happen to be talking to Steve, and he puts you right in front of Steve, and you did your whole <laughs> Hannibal Lecter routine. I don't know if you remember yeah. that was one of the all that was one of the all time classics. But I just want to play yeah. word association because there's a couple of yours that I really enjoyed. The uh, <laughs> room service, television remote, yeah. the pancake ladle. And yeah. the shoe and the shoe shine. I mean, as, I don't know yeah. if you can elaborate on all of those or not, but those are some some classic moments in the Red Wing career of Kevin Hodson. Yeah, I, I, you know, that just kind of just I think just states kind of how bad I really was as a player. Then, um, yeah, no, the uh, I, I like to I like to do things. So if we ever went to, um, you know, and I would kind of I would dictate it based on how many guys or who would be shooting at my head for practice, and I would kind of. 
you know, write, write their names down. And then I would try to get them back quietly. And, and I was actually pretty good at it. So I never got caught and I would kind of blame other people or play stupid. But yeah, I would, uh, we went to some fancy hotels, obviously I would, I'd, I'd get the room service. I'd wait till about 11 o'clock at night when everybody was sleeping. And I would, I would take my room service thing and I would put down, you know, I'd order hundreds of dollars worth of room service. And I remember at the time, Thomas Holmstrom, um, didn't speak very much English. And, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, we were, we were in California. I still remember at the Santa Monica Lowe's and I think I ordered them about $150 worth of room service at about eight in the morning. And then it would come, I'd hear the knock on the door and he'd be just, he wouldn't even know what to say. And sure enough, it would get wheeled in and, um, and you know, uh, but you know, even like, uh, going through buffets, I would always, I'd take, uh, you know, peanut butter, or I would take syrup and I would nicely put it underneath the ladles of, of things. And unfortunately, one time the coach actually picked it up first, so that didn't go too well. Um, they, 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 I was the only one in the room, so they, they kind of put two and two together. So I don't think Barry was too happy with me for a while. I remember the one time we actually, um, we were at a hotel and we brought a whole, uh, a Coke machine. It took us about an hour and a half to bring it down the Ritz Carlton hallway. And I think we locked Vernie in his room and uh, I won't say who helped us me, but I know there was four of us and, and we, it was a heavy machine. I'll tell you that, but it took us an hour and a half, but we, we got it down and we put it right in front of his door and he was, he couldn't, get, he couldn't get out. So that's, that's what we do in our spare time. I know now I don't know if they're probably eating. I'm taking notes of these things. just in case I ever need some practical joke ideas. So these are yeah, great. No, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing to know. We only, we only have time for one more question, but I have to ask you, we've yeah. heard Art called you Ticker a couple of times and your teammates called you yeah. Ticker. What is the story yeah. behind that nickname? So quickly, I got a, I have, um, I had SVT or heart arrhythmia. And when I was playing in Adirondack, um, it, we were playing a game and it, it happened to me right before uh, we were going to the arena. And Chris Draper was my roommate in Adirondack with Craig Martin. And I had said to Chris, I said, Chris, I don't feel right. My heart seems to be beating out of my chest. And I was a rookie that year. It was my, probably my fifth or sixth game in the season that year. And he said, oh, don't worry about it. It's just, you're just nervous. And he was trying to talk me out of just, you know, relax and it's going to be fine and everything else. So we drove to the arena and I said to him, I said, no, I, I don't, I don't feel right. This doesn't feel like nerves. And um, anyways, I got to the arena, they put the heart monitor on me and it was about 200 beats a minute. So I got rushed to the uh, Glens Falls hospital. And at that time it had stopped when I got to the hospital, but they knew it was something. So I had flown up to Detroit uh, they did tests there, and then I ended up getting another arrhythmia when I played for, against San Jose. And uh, I remember that I called Paul Coffey over and said, "Hey, my heart's it's not right." And then I, I went off the uh, off the ice, and then that's when they hooked me up to a machine, realized what I had, and then Chris Draper nicknamed me Ticker, and um, that was it. Once you get a nickname, you you can't erase it. It's not up to you to decide what they call you. So sure enough, it stuck, and then. Uh, um, it, I just, you know, obviously the, with the marketing department, they ran with it. And then I remember when I was playing some games, they'd have a heartbeat and other things. And, um, and then fans started calling me ticker. People still call me ticker. Now it's, uh, I get fan mail and they're like, Hey ticker. And my kids think it's the strangest thing. Cause now I'm old and you know, uh, they, they can't, you know, picture me being a professional athlete, how I look now. So it's, uh, you know, it's interesting for them to know that, yeah, your dad was called ticker and here's the reasons why, but, um, uh, it was definitely, you know, I was definitely in good hands. And I know the Illiches, I will, I, I do have a lot of respect and I, I have to thank them because they really, um, you know, they went above and beyond what they had to do for my health. And, and if, and they, you know, they gave me really good care and I got my two surgeries at the Cleveland Clinic. So, so far so good. I'm still, I'm still here. I'm still taken. Love that. Still ticking. That has to be one of the best nicknames I've ever heard, honestly. And it's got a great <laughs> story behind it. You should just Put that on your business cards too. <laughs> yeah, I should. Uh, yeah, not not many of my clients know the ticker story now, but uh, I have to thank Chris. I mean, Drapes was the one that that called me that, and it just stuck. And then Ozzy kept calling it, and then sure enough, um, I, no one ever called me Kevin. I think until I retired, and about five years after I retired, then people started calling me my real name. So it's yeah, it's, it's it brings back a, it brings back a lot of memories to be called Ticker for that way.
<laughs> That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Kevin. It has been so great to have you and so great to hear some of these awesome stories. And also a big thank you to our friends at Labatt Blue Light for presenting Downtown Hockey Town. Labatt Blue Light, refreshing Canadian Pilsner. Visit your local retailer when safe to pick up some Labatt Blue Light. Thank you again to Kevin for joining us. Art, you got to have him on the podcast or something, because I think we could have kept that going for hours with all of the stories that he has about the jokes he played on the guys. And really, he seemed like he was a big morale booster for the team. So he's probably got some more great stories up his sleeve. Well, he certainly does. I mean, I could go on and on and on about my favorite ones with him. But my, my, I think my the Hannibal Lecter thing was just bizarre. Uh, and, you know, and I can still remember Steve's expression. I mean, even he had to start laughing. I mean, and he had it down, you know, uh, flaba beans or whatever in the heck. I mean, he really, really did the Anthony Hopkins Hannibal Lecter thing down to a T. But what I used to like, he would go into a, a, a guy's room. He would take the batteries out of their television remote, then walk in with his television remote and start changing the channels as they were watching TV and the guy would just sit there and like start beating on it and going, what the heck? You know, he had no control over it. He called to the front desk and, you know, and, and I mean, he, you know, he just did things to keep it light. And, you know, I, I, you know, Ticker's a little older and Ozzy and I have talked about this and I think uh, Chris might've alluded to it when we had him on the show uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago where he talked about, you know, Ticker now is an adult. Ticker when he played for the Red Wings, <laughs> was like a man child. I mean, he was just off the hook. I mean, he was just something else, uh, a lot of fun to be around. And, you know, and, and, you know, if you look at his stats, he was not a bad goalie. He was not a bad, a, a bad goalie either. I mean, you know, he, he could actually play. I remember when he went down to Tampa Bay, he started a game against the Red Wings and actually beat them. Uh, so, uh, uh, but it's always great to catch up with Kevin Hodson. He's, uh, he, he's truly one of a kind. He really is. It was great chatting with him. And Art, I know we have all been waiting for this next interview with Matt Shepard. So I'm going to give it to you, Art, for today's headliner. Thank you very much, Danielle. It is time for the headliner brought to you by Miller Lite. Let's bring in the voice of Tiger Baseball on Fox Sports Detroit, Matt Shepard, as we talk Tigers draft. Matt, thanks for joining us. It's always a pleasure having you on The Word on Woodward. Arthur, you're looking well. I always love talking sports with you. How are you, my friend? I'm doing well, although I think I'm putting on a, like a few. Everyone I know is losing weight during this uh, shutdown, and <laughs> I just seem to get, be getting bigger and bigger. Uh, I'm going to have to start doing something. But aside from that, let's get right into the Tigers draft because the baseball draft was always one over the years that I really didn't follow because it was endless. And they drafted mm -hmm. a lot of high school players. And, you know, this one I kind of like because it was only five rounds. Tigers had six picks. But the thing that I'm encouraged about, if you look at it, they draft three third basemen, a shortstop, a catcher, and an outfielder. So obviously, mm -hmm. they're trying to replenish their farm system and this organization by going with positional players this draft, as opposed to pitching, which, as we both know, even though this was a draft that had a lot of pitching prospects, but yeah. they're pretty happy, I would assume, with where they're at pitching-wise, but it was time to shore up the positional players. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And remember this, though. Um, there, there is a situation here with Al Avila, who last year, he, David, Chad, Scott Place, they drafted their first six picks, Art, were position players, you know, led right Riley Green. They had a couple of third basemen, right, in Nick Quintana and Andre Lipsius. And they had a shortstop in Ryan Kreidler out of UCLA. They took those guys all within the first six rounds. They didn't get a seventh. They didn't get a pitcher until the seventh round when when they took uh, they, they took Zach Hess out of LSU. So yes, I think they feel it tells you a couple of things. First of all, uh, as much as this draft was rich in pitching, it was just as rich when the Tigers got their chance to check to choose um, with position players and more importantly, quality bats. The other thing it tells you, as you alluded to. It tells you that this team is really comfortable with the pitching depth they have throughout the organization. Well, I, I want to get right into the draft right now because I was a big Spencer Torkelson guy. I know that we've talked about mm -hmm. it on past shows. Uh, uh, now, are we making too much out of this that they announced him as a third baseman? Because even though, and, and the reviews have been great for the Tigers, 
that mm -hmm. everything I've read is that probably eventually when it's all said and done, he's probably going to end up at first base. But were you surprised that they announced him as a third base? Uh, I, I don't know if surprise would be the right word. Uh, it, it raised my eyebrows just a little bit. Look, the guy's really athletic, Art. I mean, he can play third base. He can play the outfield as well. He can play first base. I mean, if he can play first, he figures he can play third. Why not give it an opportunity, right? I mean, that's where more value comes from. Look at Nolan Arenado, right? You can make the shift over to first either later in your career or if you feel like there, there is a need, engagement workman works out at third base for it. Isak Paredes works out at third for it. Nick Quintana, Andre Lipsius, who's actually moved to second. Any of those guys, maybe you feel as a better glove, has a better feel for it. Okay, then so be it. But what's wrong with starting him at third base? I believe you can find first basemen in free agency and convert them from corner outfielders or from former third basemen a little bit easier than you can find quality third baseman. Would you love to have a Matt Chapman? Absolutely. Can he be that? I don't know. But there's nothing wrong with starting him that way. Here's what you know. You got the quality player, the quality power bat, and the quality disciplined hitter of this draft. It gives you an A+. Plus from that point moving forward. Well, he doesn't seem to have any qualms about it. I mean, you know, obviously he's the, he's the one, one in the major league baseball draft. I mean, you could tell him, Hey, you know, we want you to play center field. And he'd say, yeah, I can do it. I mean, I, right. I really do love his, I, I, I love his confidence. I am kind of curious. Do you think that he will, he seems to be on a fast track. I mean, what, what kind of timeline does Matt Shepard have for Spencer Torkelson before we'll see him in the old English D? Yeah, I had the same timeline for Riley Green. And and I think when you're drafted that high, you and I have followed sports our entire professional careers. When you're drafted that high, you're expected to be an impact player. Scott Pleiss, who's the director of amateur scouting for the Tigers, said that. We wanted to draft impact guys. We got impact guys. Spencer Torkelson, I figure, and you, you hate to put a timeline on it, but staying healthy, understanding his track record, the type of hitter he can be, I think he's a two years in the minors kind of guy. And then he's playing for the Tigers by the time he's late 22, early 23. Riley Green, because he was drafted out of high school, I would expect the same thing. When you look at it, let's let, let's get a little into the draft. The second round pick, you know, he's a Buckeye, and I'm such a Michigan slappy, as you very well know. I was a little disappointed, and I'll be honest. No, but uh, it sounds like Dylan Dingler is, is definitely a guy that uh, – a catcher. What does this mean for Jake Rogers? You know, because I, you, you know how, it, how this game works. Mm -hmm. They draft a catcher. Everyone thinks Jake Rogers is a catcher of the future. So what are all the people saying to me? Well, what happened to Jake Rogers? I mean, now, right. I, I mean, right. is he a bust? You know, we should not look at it that way. Dingler was a player. We had Double D on last week, Dan Dickerson, who said, hey, if he's around in that second pick, don't, don't, don't sleep on this Ohio State catcher. So obviously mm – -hmm. You can't have enough good quality players. Obviously, Dylan Dingler is one of those guys. Well, nobody said that last year when they took Cooper Johnson, did they, for some reason? No, and, and Lance no. Parrish, I talked to Lance Parrish in Lakeland. He really likes Cooper Johnson. You need depth. This is the difference with an NBA or NFL draft. We are so programmed for NBA and NFL drafts, we lose sight of just how deep a baseball system must be. That You have to have at least a minimum of two catchers at every stop along the way. So if you're looking at two catchers at West Michigan, you're looking at two catchers in Lakeland, two catchers in Erie, two catchers in Toledo, at least two catchers in the Tigers, that tells you how deep your organization must be. So I don't think that's an issue at all. This guy's got a really good arm. He's a good backstop. He's a good athlete because he started playing center field in Columbus. And I think just as important as anything else, Art, he's a two-time captain. That tells you something. You're a two-time captain at Ohio State University. That means you're doing something right. You're leading men. That's really important. That's good to see Lisa. She looks great. Uh, yeah, Lisa, and... Lisa snuck in here. Yep, she looks really good. She's all fired up. She's pretty embarrassed right now. She can't believe it, but uh, our calls are out. That's the way it's got to be. <laughs> hey, it's li it, it, it's live, right? What the hell? I mean, that's, that's the way it goes. <laughs> she oh, looks beautiful funny. as always. Though. <laughs> yes. uh, Thank you. <laughs> you know, Dylan Dingler, obviously a preseason Big Ten Player of the Year, but in mm -hmm. the third round, with the competitive balance favorite pick. pick. But, favorite pick. It, it, My favorite pick. Yeah, you, that's exactly what I was going to say because Daniel Cabrera was a guy that I think people thought was going to go higher. I mean, 62 is not bad, but 
And I someday did. you'll have to explain the competitive balance pick to me, whatever in the heck that actually means and why the Tigers were like at 62, why they weren't <laughs> right up there at like, you know, 33 or something. But, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, oh. but, that Daniel, but Daniel Cabrera practically falling into their lap I mean, I, I was ex- I was ecstatic. I mean, ecstatic. Well, I'll tell you this: when when they took when they took Dylan Dingler thirty eighth overall, I was actually borderline disappointed because that's where I wanted Daniel Cabrera, and it just goes to show you how good of a gauge that Scott Place and, and Al Avila had, and the temperature in the collective Major League Baseball room that they feel like they could have gotten such a quality player in with the competitive balance pick. I thought he was an end of the first round type of guy. I think he's a hell of a hitter, and I mean a hell of a hitter. They gave him number eight for a reason there at LSU. It's a really important number. He's a captain. You're seeing that theme throughout the draft picks that this organization has made lately. How important character, leadership are, and then the on base percentage. Look at how few times. This guy strikes out. Look at the walk to strikeout ratio. Look at it for Torkelson. Look at it for Dingler in a full season. Look at it for Cabrera. It's really positive. The only guy who might swing and miss more than we would like right now, but you can almost understand it because he's a big, strong, power hitting dude. And and that is uh, Gage Workman, the third baseman from Arizona mm-hmm. State. But so they, they, I think they've drafted certain guys with certain characteristics. I mean, look at Spencer Torkelson just for a moment, Art. Everybody assumes power hitters have loopy swings and are dead pull hitters, right? That's not who he is. He's got a very flat swing. He's got a very direct swing. He can go the other way. This guy finds the gaps. But like I said, more importantly, he doesn't strike out. He doesn't swing and miss. He's not afraid. Scott Place told us on a video conference after the draft how many times he and Alan Trammell, when they went and saw him, he, they saw him bat four times. Each time he went either 3-1 or 3-2 in the count. In other words, he's not afraid to run that count deep. And then he hits a 3-2 slider over the right center field wall. You don't see that very often. And these guys all possess that type of innate skill to not panic when they're either behind in the count or when they go deep in the count. That's really important. We already touched on Workman, uh, third baseman, Spencer Torkelson's teammate at Arizona State. As you said, you know, they really want him to like be him. more of a more of a contact hitter. If he can yeah. cut down on those strikeouts, he obviously could have a future in this organization as well. Oh, without a doubt. He's a big, strong kid. There's no doubt about it. I mean, you look at his junior year and how good he was. He was, you know, in 2020, he was off to a, a tough start. I think he was batting about 250 with only three bombs. Tarkelson had six, just to put it in perspective. Uh, after 17 games, but his junior year, he, he batted 330. He was going into this year's draft as a possible first round pick. I mean, if you think about it, Art, they got mm-hmm. four of their six picks Torkelson, Cabrera, Dingler, and Workman. Those guys were all viewed as potential first or at least high second round picks. I think it was Sports Illustrated, SI.com wrote that the Tigers had four guys who are first-round picks. I mean, that they stole Workman. This is from people, MLB Pipeline, big-time grades, right? Baseball prospect, big-time grades. Everybody feels like Detroit played the board exactly like they should have. I had a conversation with a buddy of mine the other day, and he said, I just would have liked to have seen the Tigers take a pitcher. And I said, okay, where did you want to see him take the pitcher? And they go, uh, I don't know, maybe – I don't know, maybe the fourth round. And I said, okay, who did you want? And they go, oh, I don't know. We just wanted a pitcher. And I said, that's why That's why they do what they do, and that's why you and I do what we do. They're not taking a position just for the sake of position. If you come at me and you say, I really wish they would have taken Cole Wilcox, the big, strong, right-handed pitcher out of Georgia, instead of Trey Cruz, I would say, okay, I get it. I understand that because I thought that too. I, I mean, I think I went on social media. Is this where they go pitcher? Dude's a re- now he has a bit of a problem with his control and he might not be very signable. But the Padres rolled the dice at pick 80. If you would have chosen that and then come back with the high schooler, okay, I get it. But you got to have an idea, you got to understand what the philosophy is and where they're going with it. They didn't pick guys just for the sake of picking them and they didn't pick based on need. They chose the best player they had 
on their board at the time. This is back-to-back -back solid drafts for the Tigers. And Casey Mize, of course, leading the one a couple of years ago. Hard to argue with that draft either. But, I mean, every I think everybody in Detroit who's a baseball fan should be really fired up with what they got. Well, I'm pretty fired up too. Now, the thing that I don't understand is that Colt Keith was the – People were surprised. Biloxi High School, as you said, Gatorade Player mm -hmm. of the Year, Mississippi, hit over 500, had eight home runs his junior season. I, I know that he's slated maybe to go to Arizona State, but I don't understand how this – will the Tigers have enough money to yeah. slot it for him? Because he said, yeah. listen, I've got a number. If I don't reach that number, I'm going to Arizona State. I'm not right. quite sure, you know, I've, I've been so involved in hockey, as you know, Matt, for, all, for yeah. so many years. I understand yeah. how that all works. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of curious, what do you think the potential is of signing somebody like this, whom in certain reports I've read could be the steal of the draft? Yeah, I, they don't draft him if they don't sign him. Okay, so you're not, you're not, you only have five, you try to have six picks, you only have five rounds, six picks. You're not going to quote unquote waste it, Art. You're not wasting it right. based if if you're on a guy you cannot sign. It, it makes no sense. Um, the kid also said, "Look, I've got a number. A lot of teams called. They're not willing to go to that number. The Tigers are willing to get to that number. Thus, he's going to be signing with them. So I don't think there's any threat there. Um, Arizona State. Tracy Smith is kind of bummed out. He was really proud that." The Tigers drafted Torkelson and Workman, his two corner infielders. He's probably a little bit more bummed out that he gets one of his prized recruits coming in. Hey, Matt, I wish okay, we buddy. could talk longer, man. It's great seeing you. Lisa <laughs> you looked too. great. I'm glad, you're, I'm glad your dog made an appearance. I mean, it was just, <laughs> it, oh, it was just a great It was a great time. Thank you very, very much, Matt. All we'll right. talk to you very soon. Thank you. All right. See you, buddy. There you have it. That is a headliner with Matt Shepard brought to you by Miller Lite, the original light beer with great taste and only 96 calories available for delivery. Daniela, hey, the future looks bright for the Tigers. I'm pretty excited, especially after talking to Matt. It really does, Art. He always has a way of getting you excited about Tigers baseball. He, he knows a lot and he gave you a lot of great insight there. But what was the biggest thing that you learned from talking to Matt? That, uh, you know, sometimes I started looking at the baseball draft and I tried to pour over it. And, you know, at this point, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I'm Alexi Lafreniere obsessed. You know, I, I, I've got my red underwear for good luck here, you know, and uh, uh, trying to get him. But when I really got into the draft, the one player that I kept coming back to was Daniel Cabrera. He seemed to be a guy that had so much potential. And, and I know we talked about him in previous shows, but when the Tigers ended up getting him, uh, yeah, I, I, like I told Matt just, just seconds ago, I, I was really excited about it, and he was too. When you have somebody like Matt Shepard, who I really, truly respect and because he knows his stuff, then I'm thinking to myself, you know what, maybe, maybe you're kind of on the same page. You're starting to, to, to get this a little bit more. And uh, uh, so I, I think that's it. I think Cabrera... Uh, is, is one of these, I don't even know if he's a diamond in the rough. So th that, that's what I got out of it. And and, and just how uh, the Tigers now have shifted. Last year, mostly positional players. And, you know, I'm still a big Riley Green fan, obviously. Haven't given up on him. They have the pitching. They feel really comfortable about their pitching. So I thought, again, Matt did a wonderful job in giving us an overview and giving us a behind-the-scenes uh, mindset of, uh, of what the Tigers are doing and how this team is going to be built. Uh, you know, I, I know I'm always optimistic. You know, that's just my nature. I always have been. I always I get fired up easily, especially when it comes to Detroit sports. But yeah, I don't. I think the Tigers are going to be pretty darn fun to watch here in a very short period of time. And I know the Red Wings will be. So uh, you know, re rebuilds are painful, but I think we're about to hit the fun part as we watch it, the, the cohesion of the teams come together and then turn into these, uh, you know, what we hope and I believe will be juggernauts in the respective leagues someday. Art, right, we say it once every show. There are a lot of exciting things happening in Detroit, especially when it comes to the Tigers and the Red Wings. We're headed in a very, very exciting direction. And a big thank you to Matt Shepard again for joining the show. Now we're going to get into Let's Socialize, presented by AAA for this segment. We're going to bring back Carly Johnston, who has been all over the social media all show long, taking your questions. I know she's probably got some great stuff for us today. So, Carly, what is that stuff? 
I do have some really good questions. The fans were asking the right ones today. First one is for both of you. Um, we'll start with Daniela and then we'll go to Art. Okay, if you guys could play any position on the Tigers for a game, which would you choose? I love this question. It's a good one. So, Daniela, I'll start with you. This is, this is a really good question. I like it. Um, so, for me, here's what I'm thinking. I, I think you guys all heard me bragging about my wiffle ball skills back in the day. I was a pretty big hitter. So I definitely have a solid bat, but I think I'd probably be somewhere in the outfield and I can't promise you how great I would be out there, but I've got some speed. Well, at least I used to, I can't, I don't know if I still do. So I think I'd be out there in the outfield and then I, I'd be a pretty solid bat. I'd be very dependable on the plate. Nice, good hand-eye coordination. Okay, Art, what about you? Yep. <laughs> well, you know, years ago, I was Denny McLean's producer. Uh, it, for his radio show when he first got into Detroit radio. So I got to know Denny very, very well. And I got to know really a lot of Tigers, especially the 68 guys through Denny. And uh, the one thing that through talking through Denny and about being a pitcher, and, you know, I know he wasn't a Tiger, but I was a big fan of Ron Guidry, Louisiana Lightning. Now, he wasn't the biggest guy around, but he was a left-handed starting pitcher uh, for the Yankees. I think I would, and I'm left-handed, I think I would be a left-handed starting pitching. I think that's exactly where I, where I would like. I mean, I like the fact that you control the game. You can call your own pitches. Uh, you know, it, you know, it, at the end of the day, it's you looking down at that hitter and, you know, who's the better man. So I, I like that form of competition, that one-on-one -on -one kind of thing. So I think it would be left-handed starting pitching. Love it. Okay. Pitch? That's a yeah, I don't know about that. I think I feel like I can be a good pitcher. I have a mean arm, but I have, like I cannot aim it. I don't know. <laughs> I can throw a mean yeah, spiral. I can throw a good ball. Like aim, is, not, aim well, is key, but like aim is not know, for me. Yeah, control is pretty key if you want to be a pitcher. You're, you're going to have to be able to kind of hit the hit the strike zone a little bit. So you know, but you know what, Carly, right. I see you as. I see you as a shortstop. I really do. You know, someone, you know, you're just fiery. You're out there. You're in your stance and you're like, come on, come on, come on. Yeah, hit it to me. Hit it to me. You're never, you're never going to outrun this arm. Nagger, yeah. yeah, you're never going to outrun this. You're going to, you're going to, you're just going to be, uh, you're just going to be chattering constantly. You're never going to shut up. You know, the they, you know, uh, <laughs> no, uh. you're constantly going. Yeah, I, I think it'd be great. Love it. All right. I have a question number two that I'm sure will spark more conversation. Another question again for both of you guys. What are your favorite summertime snacks? So, Danielle, let's start with you again and go to art. Carly, I know I'm going to steal a little bit of your thunder here because this is like one of your favorite snacks, but I tend to eat so much more of it in the summer and it's chips and salsa. I'm always getting different salsas, different oh, yeah. flavors. So chips and salsa, my number one, but lame I also eat a lot of fruit. I know that's kind of a lame answer, but fruit in the summer, watermelon, pineapple, all over it. That's that's my favorite. <laughs> Doesn't get much better than that in the summertime. Okay, Art, what about you? Uh, does pre-mixed margaritas count? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, I, I, sure. <laughs> whatever, you know, Art. I, mean, I don't know if it's... I don't know if it's exactly a snack. Uh, you know, I guess what I like, and you know, and maybe it's kind of a summertime kind of thing more than a snack, but um, I used to be a prep chef and a short order cook and put myself through college doing that. And, uh, uh, you know, I like making, it's a cold soup, although I haven't made it in a while, but it's called gazpacho. I'm sure you've had it before. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, it, 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 yeah. yeah, it's a mixture. Um, I could, you know, at one time I could make a pretty good gazpacho. So I would say that that's kind of my, uh, uh, my summertime snack, you know, because it's a cold soup. You really don't want to, you know, in the dead of winter, you don't really want to eat it. Although I guess you could. So I would say, you know, and nothing would go better. Nothing would go better than a big bowl of gazpacho and pre-mixed margaritas. I mean, you know, I'm set. I, you know, let it, it's going to be 90 here for the last next five or six days, but what the hell? You know, let let it do that because I'm going to be happy. There you go. I'd have to agree with Danielle though. I'd go with the fruit when the fruit is good in the summertime. There's nothing better than that. I actually just got two big watermelons. That I'm excited to cut into. <laughs> All right, time for the last question. 
It's for you, Art, because I already know your answer to this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Who's going to be the next Red Wings captain? Well, first of all, to all the guys that aren't going to get to wear the C, and I know there's several of them that are deserving, you know, you don't cry over spilt milk, right? Just move on from it because mm -hmm. there's only one guy that is going to wear the C on this team. It's not Alexi Lafreniere. It's not Mo Sider. It is Dylan Larkin without question. Uh, you know, the, uh, uh, Larkin is the next captain of the Red Wings. I think that, you know, obviously he wants it. I mean, you've talked to him. We know that. I mean, he's from here. He can't be more Michigan than he is. I mean, he played for a state school. You know, he played for Michigan. Uh, he obviously was part of the development program, the U.S. development program, which was stationed in Ann Arbor back then. You know, he grew up in, uh, he grew up in Waterford. Uh, you know, he idolized the Red Wings, even though I know his dad, Kevin, whom I love, by the way. Kevin Larkin's a great guy. Kept trying to push him to be a yeah. Leafs fan, which we know is never going to happen. Uh, so, you know, Dylan <laughs> was always a Red Wings fan. I, I just think it's the whole collection and the athlete he is and the person that he is. You know, he cares about this area. Mm -hmm. He just doesn't care. Uh, you know, he wants the Red Wings to win, certainly, and he's all competitive and he's all about that. But, you know, he has a mindset that includes – Every everything and everyone. I thought his statement last uh, last week that he came out with was was absolutely tremendous. The kid's a leader. He is the guy. He's wearing the suit. He is. He's got his head screwed on right. He's very mature, very well spoken. And I just know that if it's not Dylan Larkin, you're gonna have to have a defibrillator nearby. <laughs> I can't imagine <laughs> you being able to survive well, being named the Red Wings captain. <laughs> you know, two two things that could that that could actually send me over the edge. Uh, and I guess one's good and one's bad. If the Red Wings okay. get the number one pick in this draft lottery coming up, and I hope, I hope that you ladies, you know, I sent you all those uh, good lucks and tradition things. I hope that, you know, you're breaking plates and throwing them on your neighbor's front porch and stuff. I mean, there's all kinds of things that Did you that can do for night? luck. Um, yeah, there you go. I, I knew you would, Carly. Uh, but but with that said, I, I you know I, I really think Lafreniere getting the number one pick, which would be absolutely huge. It'd be like getting Spencer Torkelson. You know, I mean that's what we're talking about. The impact that that would have on the organization and the way it would enhance the rebuild would be great. And then if Larkin is a captain, then as Steve Eisman likes to say sometimes, I would need to be talked off the Ambassador Bridge. There's no question about that. But uh, uh, you know, so so that's uh, that that that's kind of where I'm focused right now I, I, on those two things. Larkin is the next captain, and the Red Wings somehow have to get that number one pick. I mean, 18.5 percent chance is great, but then when you add San Jose's pick to Ottawa, they're at like at 25 percent or something like that. So it's going to be a dicey right. situation for the Detroiters come a week from this Friday. It will be. I can't wait to see what happens. And Art, we always all know your opinions on everything Steve Eiserman, Lafreniere, and Larkin. But that's all I have for today, you guys. So thanks again for answering my questions. Yeah, thank you, Carly. Thank you, As Carly. Always, she is on our accounts during the entire show. So make sure you guys ask questions as you're watching. And thanks to our friends at AAA for presenting Let's Socialize. And I can't believe it, but we're actually at the very end of our show again, Art. Oh. These go by so fast now. We're having so much fun. Yeah, it, you know, it, it really is a good time. I know I keep saying this, but, you know, our, we are the best crew in the NHL. I mean, uh, well, well, how, you know, the people behind the scenes yeah. are, are the very, very best. And, you know, and I just think that, uh, you know, they make it easy. All, all I have to do is talk, and, and I enjoy talking. So, uh so I, I'm very happy. It, it does. You know, I don't think, I think we're going to have to expand this to four hours, this show to four hours. And, and I know the crew hours? behind the you scenes is, yeah, it's hours? really, they're saying, oh yeah, yeah, let's go four hours, five I days a week. They're not happy with yeah, you right I, now, I, I, are they? They're not happy with the no, four no. hour thing. <laughs> Well, you know, it was not easy we on radio. I did, I, I did. I did. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's no doubt. I never had a loss for words. You, me, and Carly. There's no way, Daniela. We we could definitely do it. And I know the crew could do it. Do they want to do it? Mm -hmm. You know what? In my heart, I think they. They hear enough. Of us. They hear enough of us. Art. That's. They can't be tortured with more of our voices. <laughs>
can you imagine being being Mike or or Mark or Eric or you know any of the fine guys that we have uh, 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 on this crew? I am sure that they wake up in a cold sweat at night hearing my voice screaming at them about something. <laughs> La Frontier, La Frontier, and it's like, oh well, Mark, Mark, honey, what happened? That Rector's in my head, man. He's got to get out of it. Jesus, you just get La Frontier. You know, right. let me alone. Let me go. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, that would be that would be something else. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Art, as we have been all quarantine long, we've been enjoying some Tigers classics on FSG, and they're going to keep that going while we don't have uh, some live baseball to watch. And tonight, we're going to get to watch the Jack Morris no hitter from '84. Tomorrow, you got the Verlander no hitter. Thursday, we've got the Galarraga almost perfect game, and then Verlander's no hitter in '11. So. It's a week of some great pitching, and I know that you're going to be watching, Art. Well, certainly. You know, when we had Jack on uh, on on uh, the word on Woodward, uh, I don't know, gosh, you know, like three weeks ago, maybe even a month ago now, uh, uh, you know, he talked about no, that game. It was, you know, it was really, really cold in Chicago, and uh, they all kind of blend into one, one gigantic, beautiful <laughs> thing. Uh, but, uh, but with that said, you know, I mean, he talked about that game, it was in Chicago, uh, you know, it was cold. It was the beginning of the season. It was the beginning of a real special year, obviously, for the Tigers. And, uh, I, you know, when you know kind of the backstory, when you hear from the actual player and what was going through his mind, uh, you know, I, and I'm pretty sure Jack Morris, and you can probably tell as this game's going, as you watch it tonight, you know, he got more and more confident that he was definitely going to uh, pitch a no-hitter, and he certainly did. Yeah, we were talking about positions, and you and Carly both said you might be pitchers, but the control isn't there. Remember, Jack said at first when he started pitching, he didn't have control. So there's some hope for your guys' future pitching careers. Oh yeah, definitely. I, I'm going to be uh, uh, I'm going to be a Disney film or something. You know, uh, you know, uh, aging person in the fourth quarter of life uh, becomes a major league pitcher for the Tigers. It could be that Kevin Costner movie all over again that critics would actually like. <laughs> Art, another reminder to you and the fans that the Tigers are still having a auction courtesy of their foundation, and that is running all the way through June 21st. So make sure you check out the website. They have so many cool items from a bunch of different players on there. Hey, it can make a really great Father's Day gift. They're going right, right up until Father's Day. So if you guys haven't got your gifts yet, make sure that you check that one out. And another reminder that there will be a virtual happy hour with the Tigers on Thursday. Matt Shepard's going to host it. We've got Casey Mize, Matt, Matt, Matt Manning. I always mess up his name. It's like a little bit of a tongue twister. Matt Manning um, and uh, Casey Mize will be joining too. So it's going to be a really cool event. You guys should definitely tune into that one. That will be on Thursday. And as always, thank you for watching The Word on Woodward. And we will see you guys on Thursday.